Yeah, I, I get a bit of a history, and I think the reason I, I, I got to talk about 150 years of business history is that Joe Martin actually believes that my advanced age, I covered the entire <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, when I was doing this, I realized that I, I divided Canadian history into 30-year chunks, and actually I have a pretty strong familiarity as a reporter on the ground with 90 of those years. So um, I wasn't always living, but I covered them, the successors to the great founders. Uh, so, uh, you know, I like to think that uh, I was doing some, uh, you know, shoe leather reporting in 1867. Uh, anyway, um, as Ken so skillfully uh, reported, I, I guess I have an hour, half an hour, don't I? Um, I, um, I used to do long business features for both the Globe and Mail, and uh, before that, the Financial Post. And, uh, and I, I covered that West-East thing um, that we heard this morning in the panel discussion, actually. The, uh, it's rather interesting, the, uh, the cycles, the economic cycles, and the boom and bust cycles of, of resource extraction, and uh, the challenges both for Atlantic Canada and for, uh, for Western Canada. And um, in all my writing, I look for the perfect individual. I mean, I'm fairly shallow in my reporting. I just want to tell it through a person, uh, an individual, the ideal person who embodies the age. Um, it, it, uh, this time, I was asked to come up with individuals who embody the 150 years. And as I say, I did divide it into 30-year sections. And um, I approached it like a, feature, a bunch of feature stories, and not necessarily the most famous or the wealthiest, but someone who embodies an era. Uh, they have to be important, but above all, they have to make a kind of a captivating story. And um, I approached it with all the themes that interested me in my uh, business reporting, entrepreneurialism, um, management, and uh, professional management, and uh, entrepreneurial management, and family business, particularly that tension, which I've continually covered. Family businesses, the challenge of maintaining a founder's vision um, into the next generation or the next to next generation uh, of sustaining the dynamism that really created the corporation to do the second and third generation, which I think is the constant story of Canada, particularly the uh, business leaders. I can only think of one industry that really not, probably is not the story, and that's banking. But even I can, pro I can fight it in that as well, probably. Um, so what I do is I, you know, they say raw material, uh, journals of the raw material history. I like to think the kind of uh, stuff I do is kind of the semi-processed material of history. And I suspect some young reporter is going to come from my stuff 50 years from now and say, it's all bunk, but at least Pitts was interesting. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Uh, or or uh, just remember, I don't write for the ages. I. Uh, I write for uh, the GO train ride, probably, and from uh, Oakville in the morning, except in the books where I hope to take it in a bit of a broader uh, tableau. Anyway, six stories in each 30-year chunks over the past 150 years, um, 1867 to 1897. Not very well known, this guy. Uh, I like to do on the uh, ground reporting all the time, so I have to go to the place. And um, I spent a lot of time going to places which are kind of neglected and forgotten. So I went to Deserado, a town about 40 uh, miles from where I grew up. And um, it's a fading village on the Bay of Quiddy, about two and a half hours east of here. Um, I drove out to the Mill Point, which is the, uh, out in the Bay of Quiddy, and there's a yacht club there and a few trailers and uh, a good park. And I kind of out really broad open area with a lot of cement footing in it, which looks like there might have been factories and mills there at one time, but long forgotten. It's kind of a bleak <coughs> area. And this was once the base of this man, industrials by the name of Edward Wilkes Rathman. He was a Yankee capitalist uh, whose family came from New York in the 1850s to capitalize on the, at that time, great pine forest of Ontario. And we heard a lot this morning about resource extraction, and that's what he was doing. Uh, he was part of a multinational enterprise with an outpost in Oswego uh, across uh, Lake Ontario. They had a port, they had a dock there, and a transshipment point, and with access uh, to by the Oswego Canal to the Erie Canal and to Albany and New York. So, a pretty good business. Um, 
uh, there was a founding entrepreneur named Hugo. That was his father. But it was Edward, off of the second generation, builds it, uh, and the third generation loses it. Um, so anyway, they built the sawmill at Desirato, and they were a household name really across Ontario in the late uh, 1800s from Georgian Bay to the Ottawa Valley. It was a huge swath of the country, a little populated, uh, and of course they had to share it with such great names as the Booths and the Eakins and other great uh, lumber barons of the time. I, uh, in the late 19th century, however, there was another um, <coughs> sawmill dynasty named the Gilmores. And they were just 25 miles west of the Bay of Quinty at Trenton, um, on the mouth of the Trent River. And that's another strain of the Rathmans were Yankee capitalists, the Gilmores were Scots capitalists. Two very important strains of entrepreneurialism in the uh, Ontario and Canada of the uh, 19th century. The uh, Gilmores had a base in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Glasgow. But from there, they first extended, they got beachheads in uh, New Brunswick. They were very big in the Miramichi in the, uh, northern New Brunswick. Then they, as they, the, as the forest depleted, they would follow the forest, literally. So they kept moving north and west. And uh, Ottawa, Quebec City, and now Trenton, kind of their last bastion, um, was Trenton. Wherever was the resource was rich, the Gilmores were there. And I do not have a picture of the particular Gilmore I'm going to talk about who was David. They're very much like the Chinese overseas families. Whenever they had a business they wanted to set up, they set out a nephew, or they set out a son-in-law, or they set out a member of the family. In this case, they sent David Gilmore, a nephew, to Trenton to run their big sawmill. Now, um, as we, these two companies engaged in ferocious competition. And as Howard knows, we love tension. We love competition. We love warfare. And they, this was the war for the woods in central Ontario at that time. Um, I would love to be there, actually. I would love to be on the ground. And I think any reporter wants to be there when uh, what they used to do is their logs used to float on the same booms, the same rafts. Uh, one, um, uh, the Gilmores had a diamond G. The Rathbun logs were marked with a star. They would float. They would use the same jobbers very often in the forest and on the... Um, and on the rafts, at the bottom of the run, there would be a big fight over whose, whose signs were on, whose logs. I just would love to have been there. It would have been a great thing to cover as a reporter at that time, the, the melee at the bottom of the run over who gets the logs and, and the bars afterwards, uh, who, uh, who is king of the woods. Now, I could have told this story through... Uh, uh, now, as a reporter, as Donald Creighton said, these companies did not so much harvest the wood, but they mined it. Okay, they, they basically plundered it and, and, uh, and left, the open, left the void in the landscape. Familiar story in resource management in Canada. Now, Ontario and Quebec pine forest was being stripped away, and uh, they tried to react to these uh, new developments in the late 1800s. Um, they had two different strategies. The Rothmans actually launched, Rothman launched a takeover bid for the Gilmore Empire, uh, but their old rivals, they could not actually sit down and negotiate, but it was probably a good idea. No two companies, both in failing industries, should ever merge just for the sake of merging. Um, then Edwards Rothman had the strategy of radical diversification. I don't think we've ever seen a conglomerate of such breadth, perhaps, in one small town as uh, Edward Rathbun, as he tried various methods to elongate the period of domination and control. Uh, there were the flour mills in various small towns, railway, everybody had a railway back then, Sachin door factory, power plants, cement plants. They introduced Portland cement to Canada, iron smelters. And in my hometown of Madoc, Ontario, the Rothmans ran the earliest phone system in town. So rapid diversification. I think there's some people here who know the, uh, how diversification from a single product uh, pass uh, can create challenges for an organization. Um, David Gilmore, who was the, um, the uh, representative of the Gilmore interest in Trenton, uh, he built, he tried to actually defy gravity by taking logs over the height of land between the Muskoka Lakes and the Trent system. And he built 
spent close to a million dollars on trying to create a transportation system that could move logs down uh, from the Algonquin Highlands into uh, to Trenton. He built a two kilometer long uh, conveyor system, a tramway they called it, uh, between Lake of Bays and the headlands of the Trent. And uh, a little bit on David uh, Gilmore. I always fascinate how third generation or fourth generation entrepreneurs feel pressure to replicate the glory of their parents or their grandparents. And sometimes Howard will know, coming to Brothmans, that a third generation family member can be a dangerous thing when he wants to replicate that, those glory days of the organization. I think of Edward Brothman Jr. and taking over, take over Vivendi being the classic example. And sometimes they make uh, company risking bets, right? And this is what David Gilmore did. Unfortunately, they found out that it took slip to so slow they couldn't get logs to Trenton within a single season. The logs were damaged, and uh, it was almost, uh, this thing was discarded. This big bet was discarded almost as quickly as they did it. And that sunk the Gilmores once and for all. You could say this was the Gilmores at last stand. Rathbuns hung on a little bit farther, a little bit longer, and, but by the time Edward Rathman died in 1903, the empire was doomed. And he, under his son, obviously a lesser mortal, died altogether. Um, so it's a great story. And it's about what I love to talk about is competition. And I think we too often we forget that some of the great business stories in Canada have been built on corporate competition, inter-corporate competition. Hudson Bay versus Northwest Company being the best example. Eaton's and Simpson's, wheat pools versus the private uh, elevator companies, wheat pools versus the cargoes of the world, and nowadays our Canada versus WestJet, one of the best nitty gritty, with all kinds of dirty tricks that have been held in the uh, interests of, uh, of airfare, modern airfare. And so what I say is what is often overlooked is the pure, zesty fun of Canadian business. So. As the Rathbuns and Gilmers were fighting it out, only about 30 miles away from Toronto, this guy was growing up in Picton, the Loyalist Bastion in Prince Edward County. A little different story. His name is Archie Wayne Dingman. Graham Bader, isn't he? Um, he um, he's the classic farm boy in Ontario. He was one of these speculators and thieves we heard about this morning, uh, who who uh, grew up farm wide in Ontario, a little bit frustrated probably with the limited possibilities of a loyalist farm in Prince Edward County and went out to see the world. And um, went for fame and fortune and he became what was really interesting in those days, a serial entrepreneur. We see a lot of him today. He was a serial entrepreneur. And um, Archie, uh, Toronto Star had a great article a few years ago about Archie. He started off as a photographer at age 21 in Picton, uh, then uh, in 1871. Then he went to Pennsylvania, where, of course, John D. Rockefeller had uh, laid the basis for the modern petroleum industry, and he worked there for a while in the, in the new oil fields. And by 1882, he was living in, a, in Toronto, where he was a soap entrepreneur. He had a soap factory, and a lot of the very colorful, ads in newspapers of the day were for Digwood Soap. So Archie had already traveled quite a bit by about 1902, but then he'd already, he, he made one other move. He got into real estate. And in a very unfashionable part of Toronto, at uh, Broadview and Queen, he erected an office building with an assembly hall at the top called Digwood's Hall. And that's where you could hear everything from orations on temperance to, you know, glorification of the, you know, speakers would come into town and use Dignan's Hall as a place to talk. But anyway, despite all that, Archie sold it all and moved west because he had the siren call of the new energy industry. And um, I don't know why exactly he left, but he became part of the wave that invaded the newly created province of Alberta. And he moved to Calgary and he began investing in energy and oil and gas, of course, being the main, uh, uh, the main uh, medium. 
Um, he was a front man for a group of investors and operators who paid pay dirt in the Turner Valley area of Alberta, south of Calgary, and they finally struck pay dirt in 1914 with Dingman Number no. 1 well. It really changed Canada. It heralded the first petroleum boom in the West, in Alberta, and Archie, so quite prophetically, we were only at the beginning as, uh, as he brought this well into, uh, into being. Well, he was right, but it took a while. World War I ended the World War One ended the Turner Valley boom, but um, and Archie eventually sold to Imperial Oil, and uh, a classic. Graham will have no doubt about this. A classic experience in the West. Um, local wildcatter gets well. Uh, U.S. multinational comes in, brings it to commercial production, does all the the other stuff like refining and distribution. Wildcatter with takes this. He made and moves on to the next well, and the next well, and the next well. It's a dynamic, and this is just perfect for Archie, who's a serial entrepreneur. Anyway, so Archie did not strike Dingman, did not strike a rich again, but he lived a very comfortable life in Calgary, and he died in 1837, just 11 years before Leduc. So the, the excitement in the, in the oil patch, which he created, in, helped create in 1915, eventually resulted in, uh, in the late 40s and the loop number one, which would really usher in the modern petroleum age in Alberta. And that was Imperial Oil. Dry Hall Hunter. How many, how many uh, wells? 100? Well, they said 130. Yeah. Might have been 103. Anyway, it was a lot. Yeah. But most of them were in 1946 and 47. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> busy man, dry hole, and a lot of them in Saskatchewan too, incidentally. So, uh, um, but anyway, so dry hole hunter is the natural successor to to uh, Archie, the boy from Picton. Um, but it's a real pattern, and uh, we've seen it over and over in the in the history of the West. Um, what happened to Dingman's Hall? That's the, the good question. Well, it's still there, and. It kind of went down the market after our cheese. And remember where all those stiff spine dowagers were going to hear about empire and temperance? Well, Jilly's, the CD strip club, took it over. And uh, the big side was girls, girls, girls. So it really went down market a fair bit after Archie had left town. Well, guess what? Jilly's is gone. There's a boutique hotel I see in there today because, well, Archie always had a nose for value, and it took about 100 years, but eventually Riverdale is very hot real estate, and they're striking gold all the time there today. So a good little side story to history. Okay, I'm up to 1927. How am I doing? About 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See? This is where I start to get into familiar history. Uh, I almost even knew this guy. I didn't quite meet him. In 1927, it was the 60th birthday of uh, Canada, and this man, Kenneth Cullen Irving, was a hard driving young owner of a string of gas stations in New uh, Brunswick and an old family sawmill in Booktouche, New Brunswick, which is just off the eastern shore. Um, he's about to make a big leap in a big time. He's about to move to open a Ford auto dealership in St. John at the mouth of the St. John River on the edge of the uh, Bay of Fundy. And, and at the 100th anniversary, about, um, about 20 years later, or 40 years later, uh, he's one of the most powerful plutocrats in the country, certainly the most powerful in the Atlantic region. And um, well, that little uh, Ford dealership has grown to become the ownership of the largest oil refinery in Canada, still the largest producer of petroleum products uh, in Canada, finished products, of, uh, and, um, and uh, as an exporter to the United States, a significant amount of the gasoline that's sold in Boston is Irving, uh, originates in that refinery. Um, but, but it's much bigger than that. Huge forest uh, and mill ownership, food processing, retail home stores, and he owned every English language newspaper in 
New Brunswick back in the days when that actually meant something. Uh, so, uh, which was a tremendous source of success, uh, and a source of, uh, of uh, power for uh, KC. Always had a favorable press uh, on the English side. And when he died in 1992, this flinty eyed, cold, remorseless looking businessman ruled St. John as a company, one of the great company towns and uh, New Brunswick as kind of a company province. There was a refinery in one end of town, still is, paper mills on the other end of town, and um, the highest point in town is uh, Arthur Irving, Casey's son's uh, house, um, where he can, he can uh, look at it all. Um, Frank McKenna, when he was premier of New Brunswick, used to say, <coughs> The McCain's let me. Uh, the McCain's ruled a third of the province. The Irving's ruled a third of the province, and they let me have another third of the province uh, uh, as the provincial premier with, uh, with all the uh, uh, with, with all the economic uh, influence that had. Um, no one can rival the Irvings today, but a lot of them do. We have a lot of regional clans and uh, with a lot of power in uh, in the Maritimes. Uh, I've written, a, this is really basically kept me into a comfortable retirement, talking about these people, or any of these people. Uh, the McCain's in the upper St. John Valley, the Sobeys and Braggs in northern Nova Scotia, you know, Pick Two in the, uh, in New Glasgow and Stellarton. Uh, the Murphys, a family you may not have heard of, but own hotels and restaurants in PEI. Uh, you think agriculture is the big business? No, it's the Murphys in PEI. Uh, and tourism, of course, feeds on that. Uh, the Jodries in the Annapolis Valley, somewhat, uh, I, which I've written about in my latest book available through Amazon and I think a number of good bookstores. Um, the Rose and Risleys in Halifax, um, and the Shannons now in Cape Breton, um, very, very strong uh, family. They're not, the Sobeys are public, publicly traded, but they don't tend to be publicly traded companies. Uh, they're private businesses. A lot of the families have yielded to outside professional management at the top, while the family looks after ownership. I don't say stick to the knitting anymore. I understand that's not uh, that's not a good word to use anymore. But uh, anyway, they the families look at ownership and uh, management of the capital. Um, however, the Irvings have never gone to outside management at the top. They're the one great exception to this. My last two books have been basically about conciliary, the people who advise family businesses in the Maritimes. Bertie Crawford was an advisor to the Sobeys and the Braggs. Uh, Graham Day to the Sobeys, the Olins, the Jodries. The Irvings do not have conciliaries. They are only themselves. And they're the most parochial and yet strangely successful and strangely worldly in their ambitions. So it's, it's one of those... Uh, it's like the Rathbuns had continued and they were born again as the Irvings in the, uh, in the, in the 20th century. So, uh, I haven't talked a lot about journalism so far, but this is where journalism and history link. Uh, always fascinated with the Irvings, and a few, you know, let's say about 10 years ago, I happened to be at a business meeting where the Irving family showed up. Actually, it was the Canadian Business Hall of Fame unveiling their uh, Hall of Fame members for the year. And it was the three Irving brothers, son of, uh, sons of KC. And one of them just told me, oh, absentmindedly, as if I wouldn't pay any attention, we're splitting up the empire. So I rushed back to the Globe and I wrote a story with fairly powerful repercussions. The Irvings had been functionally split up their empire years ago, but now they were doing it by ownership. The old trust that ran the company, KCA's great creation, uh, was being uh, split up. So I was able to report that, and uh, later on I was able to do a lot of reporting on how the energy company still has this refinery, uh, has real succession problems as well as we go into this, uh, as we moved into this century. and. Um, um, they've gone through a number of CEOs. There's a leadership vacuum there. And I guess I want to hang around a little while longer because I may write the last chapter, the KC chapter, the chapter of his sons, and maybe the end, the, the denouement of the Irvings as, a, uh, as an economic force. Don't tell uh, Arthur I said that, though. Um, okay, so that's 
this man, by the way, I didn't know that Power Corporation and uh, Great West Life and all those companies were going to be sponsoring. This is not, this is not <laughs> Power. In, in 1957, as KC was uh, plotting his empire, building his refinery, Paul Demery and his to embark on a great uh, entrepreneurial career. At 30, he is the owner of a bus line in Sudbury. He bought it from his family, it was failing, he bought it for a dollar. And uh, he was building that into a major transportation company. He was consolidating the inner city bus traffic in parts of Ontario and Quebec. Uh, and he was poised to move to Montreal at that time and to play in the big leagues of Montreal commerce. In a complicated share deal in the 1960s, he acquired a, an old utility holding company called Power, and, and never a more appropriate term has ever used for, uh, for a Canadian uh, corporate builder. Power Corp became the base of a financial services industrial conglomerate, spans the continent, crosses the Atlantic Ocean, active in Europe with partners for decades, and when I went to China in uh, about 15 years ago, report for the Global Mail, Power was the one sophisticated player on the ground that knew that market, had been there for years. And um, but, but, but Demery, of course, as we heard today, had a wonderful time. He was there at the birth of the uh, Quiet Revolution, which Quebecers before became more commercially engaged. Um, and then in time, the emergence of what the speaker today described as Quebec Inc., um, a, a, an entrepreneurial class. Um, a loose terminology for this melange of Quebec nas economic nationalism, state industrial policy, and these rising entrepreneurs, uh, Pierre Pelladeau, Jean Coutu, uh, Rémy Marcoux from the Beauce, along with Marcel Dutille, the Bombardier Baudelin family, uh, the biggest and I think most successful of all uh, has not only been Demeray. Now, when he was at home in China, he was comfortable with state capitalism uh, in his own home, uh, and he had a very sophisticated view of the role of government and, uh, and capitalism. Um, before he died, I mean, he had a robust succession plan to get earlier. He carved up the empire between industrial and financial holdings, put one of his sons in charge of each, and looked at how, we, how this is going to be structured in the next generation. But, uh, it's very robust and very resilient, unlike a lot of these families. I interviewed him uh, before he died four years ago, uh, but I'll, I was fascinated for another reason. Um, the dual-class shares by which the family controls um, the company. And as a journalist, this is one of my uh, fascinating areas, the areas I tried to cover. The Demeray has been a champion, a very articulate champion, in favor of dual-class shares where families can tap public capital markets and not give up control. Very controversial globally and, uh, and in Canada. And, uh, but we look at the Canadian companies that use dual class shares and they are the household names. Uh, obviously the banks can't do it, um, but uh, you look at uh, Power Corp, Capacor, Magna, Rogers, Linamar, Kojiko, Sobeys, Loblaws, Shaw, Atco, on and on the bulwark companies. Now, what I liked about the Murray family is that they're not afraid to get down and dirty and defend this by saying, okay, you invest in us, you know what you get. You're not getting votes, but we have delivered such a strong long-term return to investors, and we've never been quiet about the fact. We've never been trying to hide. You're taking an investment in the Demeray's long-term vision. So anyway, um, but now this model, of course, is under attack. There's a test case out there, the Bombardier case, where perhaps the family has lingered too long in the affairs of an organization. Finally, do I have 10 minutes? Uh, we'll give it to you. Okay. This guy. <laughs> 1987, Michael Best wrote his Northern Enterprise, History of Canadian Business. This guy wasn't mentioned. Shows you what's happened, what Jimmy has done. Jimmy Pattison, James Allen Pattison has done over the past 30 years. And um, they've been Jimmy Zero. He's the embodiment of West Coast business. 
and the age of sort of boundaryless free trade business. Uh, um, and uh, 1987, of course, we were in a free trade era, getting into a free trade era at that time, and Jimmy has benefited tremendously from it. But let me tell you a little bit about Jimmy. He's now, he'll be 89 next month. He's kind of the Canadian Russian Ultra hero, born in a Depression family in um, Saskatchewan, son of a drunk car dealer who found Jesus on the streets of Saskatoon. Pat Patterson moved west, moved the family to Vancouver, and Jimmy grew up watching his father gravitate between selling cars and uh, tending to a mission, a church mission, uh, on the, on the uh, Vancouver's east side. And it was a mission that used to take in lumberjacks and people in trouble, uh, people from the interior, and Pat Patterson would tend to these people and try to revive their lost souls. Vancouver was then kind of the end of the continent, California in the north, last chance for a lot of people, including Jimmy's dad, and I guess Jimmy himself. He got into car sales, he's the dynamo, he's famous for firing the worst performing salesman every year, every month, and uh, he parlayed that hard edge and the soft, uh, churchly ways into a uh, economic empire. Um, he bought businesses that have nothing in common. They just have one thing in common, and that's their owner. This little guy who flies from place to place, uh, who is looking at numbers every day, the numbers from his, 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 uh, his car leasing operations, and he's very old economy. Lumber, um, coal shipping, signs. Signs for us. It's more old economy than that. Uh, and car dealerships. He's a globalist, and uh, he's benefited from continental free trade and from China's entry into the uh, WTO. <clears throat> and he's enhanced Vancouver's status as a hub of globalization, a magnet for money around the world. Vancouver is a hard place for a journalist to figure out. There are a number of reasons. Uh, Globe has done miserably over the years at covering Vancouver business for a number of reasons. <coughs> Private wealth. Offshore ownership of companies, private companies, who are just like Jimmy. They're global citizens. They're not really citizens of Canada in the normal sense. Uh, Jimmy flies among his assets. Uh, he hasn't done China. He'd like to, but he never does business uh, where uh, he doesn't really feel comfortable with the, with the culture, the business culture. Um, he is the anti Um A figure for a more ephemeral age. And I don't think the Jimmy Patterson, Patterson's group will survive the owner for very long. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, okay, you can see I'm fascinated with entrepreneurialism. I'm going to wind it up now. As a journalist, this is what I've covered. It's been my heart and soul for the past, uh, in my books and in my uh, writing. The next 30 years, will they be dominated by empire builders who want to perpetuate their corporate creations, the Irvings? the Demeray, or by serial entrepreneurs like Archie Dingman. I guess you'll agree we'll probably see both of those. And uh, I guess Howard's going to deal with, can we report on these things as they happen and pass them over to you historians uh, after we've done some of the working with the raw materials? So I'll leave it to Howard to talk about those challenges and uh, get off the stage. And thank you. Yeah.